Good evening. I'd like to call the Tuesday, December 16th, 2014, City of Gardner Planning Commission meeting to order. Everyone will please rise and state the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I have roll call starting on my right. Gilmore here. Barber here. Mater here. Kim Z here. Liber here. Austin here. Quorum is present. We'll move into the consent agenda. All matters listed within the consent agenda have been distributed to each member of the Planning Commission for study. These items are considered to be routine and will be enacted upon by one motion with no separate discussion. If separate discussion is desired on an item from either the Planning Commission or from the floor, that item may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. Are there any m items a uh, any member of the commission would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Okay. Any items any member of the public would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Awesome. Okay, we have a motion made by Barber with a second by Gilmore to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Moving into old business, item number one. Hold a public hearing and consider amendments to Title Eight, Chapter 8.100 of the Property Maintenance Code and Title 18, Chapters 18.140 of the Zoning Ordinance of the Gardner Municipal Code regarding the storage <coughs> of hauling trailers and recreational vehicles on residential property. This is continued to, from the uh, last meeting to the December 16th, 2014 meeting. Presentation this evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Michelle Leininger, Principal Planner. Um, item one old business uh, as the chairman read is text amendment regarding the storage of hauling trailers and recreational vehicles on residential property um, the council has discussed this issue at two work sessions and one council meeting over the last few months um, regulations regarding the storage of these items are provided for in chapter 8 property maintenance and chapter 18 zoning ordinance of the municipal code Planning Commission has jurisdiction over the zoning ordinance, though staff has provided draft language for changes to property maintenance code for information purposes as the regulations are linked. Uh, council has directed staff to draft language that would permit the parking of hauling trailers used for residents' occupation to be stored in the front yard on paved driveways as long as the trailer does not encroach over a sidewalk. Additionally, a second trailer, RV, or boat was directed to be permitted and stored on the same lot if stored in the side or rear yard. 
This is an increase in number of items permitted to be stored from one to two. Just go through the draft language. Um, this is included in your staff report, so it'd be be difficult to read for on your screen. Um, this is section 18.140.100G, um, updated it to reflect outdoor storage of equipment, uh, material, and vehicles. Um, what, what we're proposing is to reorganize the section and to add specific standards uh, related to storage of hauling trailers, boats, RVs, campers, and operable vehicles and storage of materials, products, and equipment. Um, what we've done with this language is um, added A, which specifically speaks to hauling trailers used to primarily support residents' occupation. Um, council asked that it be stored on the driveway and that the trailer be parked so that it's not um, encroaching over a sidewalk. Um, they really felt that it was a safety issue not only for pedestrians, but potentially if it is an enclosed hauling trailer, it could block views from neighboring people um, moving in and out of their driveways. Um, a is just, or B is just an expansion of um, A, what I had talked about. Um, rear and side yard storage areas need not require to be paid. That was um, existing language. Um, really what I did is G and H were standards that related to the same thing. Proposing to delete H and incorporate everything into one section in a format that's a little more reader friendly. Um, so that's where D comes in, um, talks about how you can um, park a boat, camping trailer, motorhome, recreational vehicle in the driveway for loading and unloading purposes for a time not to exceed 48 hours in a 30 day period. Um, that allows for you to load your vehicle, unload the vehicle before and after uh, you take it wherever. Um, we did add an exception, um, section E. Um, well, we expanded on that. That was the, the first part of it, plans indicating screening to be installed and setbacks. Um, to be granted an exception that was previously in, or not previously, is in the existing uh, language. Um, and then we added for the exception of the demonstration that the vehicle or other hauling trailer is used primarily to support a resident's occupation. Um, at the, the last work session, well, during the, during the meeting after the work session, um, there was somebody that stood up and noted that there could be a situation where you had an RV or a vehicle that would qualify to not be parked in a driveway that could be used for work purposes. Um, if you were had an RV that had, you stored some of your um, merchandise and such in. Um, so we, we included an exception possible exception for that. Um, and then F talks about inoperable vehicles. And again, the current regulations permit one trailer, boat, camper, RV to be stored on a lot in an R1 or R2 district in a side or rear yard. Uh, this is number two of section, section G. Um, this talks about outdoor storage of materials, products, and equipment. Um, this partially is in the existing regulations. Um, we've added some text to state that these type of materials, equipment, and such shall be um, stored in a fully enclosed accessory structure. And this is the section of the property maintenance code that uh, we're looking at, or the council will be looking at. This relates directly to um, section 18.14.100G and H is referenced here. Um, look at the text on the screen. 
G, or not G, the green part at the end of the, the section is what was in the staff report. Um, we tweaked the language um, in that little portion and uh, added the blue portion. Um, this is just for reference for what the council will see, just for clarification to make it um, read a little better. Um, this staff recommendation is revised from what is in your staff report. Um, again, what I had stated earlier is that the Planning Commission only has jurisdiction over the zoning ordinance and subdivision regulations. Um, the reference in the staff recommendation in the staff report includes uh, the property maintenance code section, chapter eight. Um, so I've just pulled that portion out of there um, and that's what the staff recommendation on the screen is. And staff recommends the Planning Commission hold a public hearing <laughs> and forward the amendments to section 18.140.100 of the Gardner Municipal Code regarding the storage of boats, trailers, and recreational vehicles to the City Council with a recommendation for approval. Thank you, Michelle. We'll now open the public hearing. If anyone would like to comment on this item, please come forward and state your name and address for the public record. Individuals are allotted three minutes or an individual representing a group is allotted seven minutes. Here we have anybody wishing to speak this evening. I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. I'll second. We have a motion made by Barbara with a second by Kinsey to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Public hearing is now closed. This is the Planning Commission discussion. Any questions or comments from staff? Now is your chance to speak. I think the only question that I had is in uh, G2. Would it be appropriate to add four fence to the last line so that if you're con doing construction on your fence to the property, you can store the materials outside of the structure? Or is the just anywhere on your property considered within the dwelling. Could you repeat that? I'm not sure I quite. Uh, I I think the answer is that that's fine. In the in the last sentence where it allows. Um, storage of construction materials or equipment related to active construction activity upon the dwelling or accessory building located on the lot upon which the construction and materials are stored after accessory building could we add or fence so that if someone is constructing their fence they would be allowed to store that material outside of the structure yeah that would be you can have a trailer with uh, your um, in your driveway that's got your work related things on it does that would that also include say um, junk cars if you own a junk car you know a, a junkyard would that be okay to then have junk cars on a trailer in your driveway I would as trying to chip in, but I would think that would fall under F as storage of inoperable vehicles, whether it's on a trailer or not. Even if it's for your business, if you own a junk junkyard. I mean, some of this is ultimately going to be left to the discretion of the code of the code enforcement uh, agent. Um, 
you know, I, I suppose we could carve out any probably number of um, distasteful um, occupations that people could have things on the back of uh, of the back of a hauling trailer. Um, it's kind of hard to legislate all those. Okay, um, being devil's advocate, trying yeah. to because I mean I'm just you know there's ways you to get around. You know, there it seems like a little bit of a loophole there. Yeah, I mean if you you know um, pump septic tanks and you kept your tank where you pump septic tanks as your work trailer and your driveway well. You're Johnny on the spot, so it's okay to have those. Right. Right, 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 right. Okay. I think it's, you know, in theory that if that is something that supports your occupation, it wouldn't be there for a very long period of time. Um, if it is there for a long period of time, I think then it would lump into the sto outdoor storage of those materials in, uh, in, in operable vehicles. Okay. We, you know, we do also have other code provisions that could deal with different types of nuisances. I mean, there's a nuisance provision that talk about, you know, a, a junked car on the back of a trailer wouldn't necessarily be applicable, but my, you know, septic tank pumper trailer probably would be because it would be um, a, a public nuisance due to odor and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, so there are some other tools that we can we can use to enforce anything. And, and, and that's another piece too, I mean, and that was also discussed at the governing body is really, I mean, our city regulations just kind of set the floor. I mean, most uh, residential subdivisions where houses are close to one another also have um, uh, covenants and restrictions, which, which may restrict a lot of this, or homeowners associations okay. that, you know, have amendment provisions, and so if there's an issue, then within the individual Association and the covenants and restrictions, you know, the homeowners can elect to make those more restrictive as that group of homeowners wants. This just kind of really lays the floor upon which you know, additional restrictions can be placed on private property. Okay. Questions? Any other questions or comments? entertain a motion on this item. I move that we forward the uh, amendment to Title VIII Property and Maintenance Chapter 18.140-100 of the Gardner Municipal Court Code regarding the storage boats, trailers, recreational vehicles uh, with a recommendation of approval. Second. But, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. 18. Yeah, we probably might take up the friendly amendment. Which one? Oh, yeah. Title 18. Just like there you go. Okay. Yeah, I crossed the card out okay. accidentally. Okay. Title 18, zoning yeah. ordinance. Okay. Yeah, you dropped that. <laughs> so I was making it up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Title 18, zoning ordinance chapter. You can go ahead and read it off the screen. Read right. it off the screen. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, forward amendments to section 18.140 100 of the Gardner, Gardner Municipal Code regarding the storage of boats, trailers, and recreational vehicles to the City Council with a recommendation for approval. Um, and then before there's a second, there was a offer for a friendly amendment on the fence. The an offer group? That's right, the amendment on the fence. So how do we word that? You can just say including um, the amendment to um, G2 regarding Fence. Okay, with an amendment including G2 for the fence. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion made by Timsey with sort a second of. by Limer. <laughs> see if I can get this right. To, uh, for the amendments to section 18.140.100 of the Gardner Municipal Code regarding the storage of boats, trailers, and recreational vehicles to the City Council with a recommendation for approval to include the G2 section outlining fence in the language. Would all those in favor please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries with all in favor. Good job. Okay, new business item number 1A and 1B, but we'll read them separately because we have two separate actions to take. So, 1A. PP-14-03 Copper Springs 3. Consider a preliminary plat for Copper Springs 3, an approximately 10.45 acre residential development generally located northwest of the intersection of 163rd and University Drive, submitted by David Rhodes on behalf of Gardner Property Partners, LLC, property owner of record as well as new business item 1B, FP-14-06, Copper Springs 3. Consider a final plat for Copper Springs 3, an approximately 10.45 acre residential development generally located northwest of the intersection of 163rd Street and University Drive, submitted by David Rhodes on behalf of Gardner Property Partners, LLC, property owner of record. Staff presentation <coughs> Good evening, commissioners. <coughs> Travis Hulse, planning technician. Um, for you this evening, we have a preliminary and final plat application as stated for the following subdivision, residential subdivision as proposed by the applicant. Um, to point out some of the existing conditions and get you reference to where we're at, um, the proposed subdivision that we have before us is actually part of approximately 136.29 acre development that was originally um, approved through a preliminary plat back in 2004. Um, our subdivision regulations require that a final plat be submitted within a year of the preliminary plat approval. So the applicant has provided both a preliminary and final plat, but specifically um, just for that 10.45 acres um, as both a preliminary and final plat. Currently, there are some existing street improvements and utilities which took place um, back when the original approval was uh, granted a number of years prior to now. You'll see that much of the area um, is zoned R1, which is your single family residential zone district and borders up against the city limits uh, to the west with Johnson County. And that's where you get your um, separate zoning designations. To the north, there are some existing single family homes, um, a part of the Copper Springs subdivision. Um, that's Copper Springs 1. I'm going to show you that here. So this is the entirety of that 136 acres. Copper Springs, um, as it currently exists today, is almost completely developed with a few remaining lots. And then as proposed this evening, Copper Springs 3 um, for both the extent of the preliminary and final plat area. So it's not going to include um, any of the other portion of what you're seeing here, but just to kind of reference for um, some of the future points in this presentation. For those of you who may have not had a chance to go out there to visit, these are some images captured of the, the existing conditions. Um, a lot of the improvements that were put into place were done so um, they were there never were they were never completed um, and quite honestly were never um, approved prior to being constructed and, and whatnot. So you have a lot of failing systems out there. Um, the streets themselves would require an additional you know, four to five, six inches of um, surfacing. And a lot of other concerns are out there that will need to be inspected and verified uh, prior to the construction. And this is more just a kind of give you a background on, on where this is currently at. Obviously, that will be handled as part of the, the public improvements through public works and the construction process. So not a part of what we're considering today, but just to point out in reference where exactly 
um, the application of the subject property is taking place. So project summary, the um, plat application is for 32 lots uh, for new single family dwellings. There will need to be some additional sidewalks added along the streets as part of the requirements of the subdivision regulations um, for both local and collector streets would require four feet of sidewalks along any portion of the street uh, located within the platted area is shown here. Um, again, the in, there would need to be, there will be inspections and repairs to infrastructure as necessary uh, to take place through the construction process. All of the easements have not to this point been dedicated um, as this land is unplatted at this point in time, but the applicant is proposing to dedicate both easement and right of way to provide for all utilities and roads as seen here. Um, the roads as you see them for the location are going to remain the same and the extent to which you see them as well. There's not going to be any additions at this point in time, um, but would take place with uh, future phases of the development. As far as meeting the zoning regulations and subdivision um, requirements with lot arrangement and size, road right of way width and building setbacks, um, staff finds that the applicant meets all requirements. Here are some of those dimensions for lot arrangements um, and size, meeting the minimum lot area of 8,000 square feet, um, a 70 foot width um, as measured at the building line as a minimum and an average lot depth of 115 feet, just to point out a few. And then here are the building setback lines. Um, a part of the zoning regulations for this specific um, R1 zoning district is what determines the setback requirements for a home, how far it is located back from the property lines, both on the front and side yards where applicable. Staff is going to and recommends within um, approval of this application that a condition of approval be added to remove those setback lines from being shown on the final plat application. That's to prevent some concerns later on. Um, if the zoning regulations were to be changed or amended, then they may not, they may no longer comply um, with those standards of meeting a minimum 30 foot setback or 20 foot setback. So for sake of clarity and um, future concerns, we're asking that those be removed. They can remain on the preliminary plat, but for the final plat as it proceeds forward. A part of the Platting process, um, in addition to road right of way easement dedication, is also um, trail dedication for our parks system um, here in the city of Gardner. According to the 2009 Parks Master Plan that was um, adopted by the Planning Commission and approved by City Council, there is a potential arterial pathway and bike route as well as. Um, nearby proposed subdivision pool and park that is located within the general vicinity. Um, due to some of the current site constraints, having that Copper Spring subdivision that is already developed as well as um, no identified future arterial roadway going as shown in the adopted plan, and this is a portion of the plan that I uh, took out of that document, being that neither of those two things exist, there was some concern that um, the reality of a um, pathway linking up to the, the existing pathways throughout the city of Gardner would, would make a whole lot of sense. So the applicant um, has been working with staff and has proposed some potential alternatives. One of those would, to be, would be to, in the future, not as a part of this process, but in the future development, um, locate a pathway potentially nearby the floodplain. Um, and in order to do that, because this is an adopted document, we would recommend that through this process and as forwarded on to the city council, 
that a tax amendment be initiated or an amendment to the master plan be initiated to allow staff um, to basically redraw that that current path that you see to fall more in line with um, some of the site constraints that exist today and some of the other the policy guiding goals and objectives that the parks uh, master plan outlines. Staff's recommendation for the preliminary plat is that the Planning Commission approve the preliminary plat application um, due to some clerical issues uh, with the, the applicant engineer. The labels currently show on the documents that we've provided to you, um, Copper Springs 2 as the subdivision name simply just needs to be um, revised to state Copper Springs 3 in any of those areas prior to the recording of the final plat. And then in addition, as a separate motion, uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve final plat application FP-14-06 um, for Copper Springs 3 and forward to City Council with a, re with a recommendation for approval to accept the easements and rights of way subject to the following conditions. Um, I'm not going to read through all of the conditions, but to point out a couple that I didn't get the opportunity to state, excise tax will need to be paid prior to the final plat. Um, the excise tax would be based on approximately seven some odd acres excluding the road right of way um, will need to be paid in full with the 20 cents per square foot that's currently levied. Um, all additions and corrections noted by our engineering division shall be completed prior to recording the final plat. Again, those are just clerical things that need to be cleared up on the document itself. It's not going to change anything that um, you see before you. And then the rest of the items is, is stated already. If we have the applicant with us this evening tonight or not. Yes. If there's anything you'd like to um, present or if you're just here for questions. I'm just here for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll open this up for uh, planning commission discussion. Do you guys have questions for the staff or the applicant? Um, I thought that was very interesting in the um, the staff report about the building setback lines being removed um, due to zoning ordinances um, which may change. This isn't something that we've seen yet. Um, I, I was not necessarily surprised. It was just kind of a interesting. I, I didn't understand what may change may not change could we expect to see something like this could this detrimentally you know impact a uh, person anticipating a, a house of a certain size only to find out that zoning ordinances have changed and oh now it's, it's a different size of a house due to how the building setbacks have changed i kind of that's kind of like a three-part question i threw it out at you sorry let me know if this gets to what you're looking for um so currently the, the city is in process of doing a land development code rewrite to where some of these zoning regulations that we currently have could be affected. Um, and thus you have the problem of having a plat on file that says so many feet that it needs to be set back and that could change. So as far as um, when a building permit is pulled for a single family home, we review that plan based on the current current code regulations, which today state that the setback requirements would be 30 feet from the front yard, 20 feet from the side yard, so on and so forth. Um, so as those change, that's something that the, the design professionals, the architects and engineers involved would need to be aware of. Um, I guess it could potentially impact a home buyer in the sense of, you know, if they see a plat, especially with the approved dimension, assuming that that's what it's going to be, right. 
then if that changed, then certainly that would. Or even, you know, driving through, because there's part of Copper Springs that is, exists today. And right. they are built, you know, with these, I think, with these set of zoning ordinances on the books. And if I'm driving through, you know, oh, okay, this kind of looks like, you know, what I would expect to have, you know, then come around and find out, oh, wait, you know, they've done some changes within the ordinance and I'm getting something different. I just, I, I just didn't know how that would, would go over and if we would be expecting um, additional recommendations such as this to remove building lines. Is this going to happen quite often as we're going through the rewrite? I, it just seems too just intangible at the, at the moment when we have, you know, a, an ordinance on the books and we're saying, oh, well, we're going to just wipe that clean for now because they may be changing. It just, I didn't, I didn't understand that. Well, the, I might yeah. jump in. Sure. So, so the, under the platting laws of the state of Kansas, it prescribes what's supposed to appear in a plat. Building setback lines are not one of the things that are supposed to appear there. Um, you're supposed to have public rights of way and easements, um, uh, you know, lot, lot lines, things like that. Having these setback lines reflected on the plat, I mean, really does nothing. It doesn't affect our ability to change the code. Mm -hmm. Doesn't affect our ability to leave it the same. Um, so, really, I think the concern about leaving them on there is that in a situation where you would have a change that would allow or be more permissive, meaning uh, you might have had a 30-foot setback at one point in time, but then you change that to a 20-foot setback. Well, when you file the plat, it says 30-foot, but when they go to build the home, it's 20 feet. And so now you've built um, into the setback line that's reflected on the plat. When a title company goes in, when, you, when that homeowner looks to sell that piece of ground, the title company is going to trip onto that and probably list it as an exception on the title report, which is going to create lots of headaches for people when they try to sell their homes. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it's, in my opinion, it's best if you just leave it off. It's not one of the things that's supposed to be on the plat. It has no meaning because it's on the plat, and it's really just going to create um, title problems and clouds on title if you do allow, allow it to continue to be there. Okay. Um, the, the other piece that you were talking about, mm -hmm. if you've built a house in reliance on <clears throat> the, the code um, being, um, let's say, 30-foot setbacks, and then we later change it to 40-foot setbacks, and now you've already built your house within the 30-foot setback and, you know, the 40-foot setback, you're, you're 10 feet over the line. You, um, you would be a legal non-conforming use. In other words, you're grandfathered in, so that has no effect on, on those property owners. So. Okay. That, thank you. That provides clarity. Can I just add a comment? Sure. From a developer's perspective? Sure. Um, I developed some ground. It's called Wilbur Estate. Why don't you come up? Just oh, yeah. Come on up, please. Sorry. State your name and address. Sure. Thank you. I'm Dave Rose. This is my office, 335 West Madison, Gardner, Kansas. Um, I, I developed Bethel Estates, and I'm, I'm sure you know Bethel Estates, that's a senior community out here, as, as well as Willowbrook uh, uh, Housing. We had this problem with Willowbrook, and that's maybe why they're writing it in now or wanting to exclude it, but we had a plat that was filed with the county, and it had a 25-foot setback, builder setback, front yard. Um, the ordinance had changed, and the ordinance changed to a 30-foot setback. When we sold the lots to the builder, they relied on the 25-foot setback, and they ordered plot plans. They had everything engineered for a 25-foot setback. That increased the distance of the driveway, so you moved it back to 30 feet, so we had more concrete. We had to re replat, the, not replat, but redo plot plans on all of the lots. The only thing that I would say from a developer that I would throw as input to a planning commission, I would hate to do a 32 lot subdivision and then find out that halfway through the ordinance changed and now I've got a different setback. So I've got houses going like this throughout, throughout the plat. Um, if it could be consistent through the planning process that you at least have your final plat grandfathered to what the ordinance was at that time, 
if someone comes in with a new plat, I understand. But I think the, the, the dilemma is when it's finally platted and when you pull the building permit. And I think that's when it's going to have the rub if there's a change. So for me as a developer, I'd like to have the houses all sitting similarly and not be bumped from 25 to 30 to 32 to whatever. And if I sell them to a builder, he's going to rely on whatever that um, setback is the time he builds or wants to take down the lot. So I just throw that out for the developer to don't don't tie our hands too much. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I I did have one other question, but I don't want to. I'm looking, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, so the uh, the part about the the trails, I understand that, but just a question. So um, the sentence about in moving forward as an alternate location, staff request initiation from the city council to amend the approved 2009 parks master plan. Well, I looked in the, um, uh, the gosh, what did we just get done walking through here? What it, the comprehensive plan and I noticed there was actually some trail suggestions and maybe that's the reason we have to have the amendment to the 2009 parks master plan specifically but I saw some proposed trails directly to the west of the proposed um, subdivision this evening understanding that currently that land to the west is Johnson County it's not city of Gardner um, but I did notice that in the trails section of the comprehensive plan it was already drawn out for trails to run directly to the west so I, I just just seeing that I didn't know if this was kind of a technicality because the 2009 parks master plan is on the books or if comprehensive plan supersedes I, I didn't know while we get to that um, so yeah because it because it's an adopted document that's why it would require the council to um, support initiation of an amendment to the plan in order for us to manipulate whatever is shown in the 2009 parks master plan being now that we have the comprehensive plan that equally suggests and this was based on some of those documents so when when our consultant when the city and all of the involved parties went through and identifying some of these potential trails was supposed to kind of bring those into play and determine those so this would be a document to help guide when we potentially um, make that revision to the parks master plan um, but would require that the council initiate it in order for us to to go ahead and make that change if that makes sense that does that answers my question thank you don't have other questions or comments from the Commission I would um, entertain a motion knowing that we we have two separate motions to take this evening guys we have um, the prelim and the final so I don't want to prevent you guys from asking any questions but if uh, everyone's comfortable I would entertain a motion I'll make a motion that we uh, recommend that the Planning Commission approve preliminary plat PP-14-03 for Copper Springs 3 subdivision subject to condition 1. Second. We have a motion made by Barber. We'll uh, give the second to Austin that we approve the preliminary plat PP-14-03 for Copper Springs 3 subdivision subject to the following condition number one. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. Don't have any questions on 1B. I'd entertain a motion for that one as well. I move to approve final plat FP-14-06 for Copper Springs 3 subdivision and forward it to the City Council with the recommendation for approval and to accept the easements and rights of way subject to conditions one through seven. Second. 
We have a motion made by Austin with a second by Barber that the Planning Commission approve final plot FP-14-06 for Copper Springs 3 subdivision and forward it to the City Council with a recommendation for approval and to accept the easements and rights of way subject to the following conditions 1 through 7. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries with all in favor. And not having anything else on the agenda this evening, I'm going to ask if we had anything. Just wanted to um, jump in and give you an update um, the, from the council meeting last night. Um, they took action on the five tax amendments that you saw last night. Um, they did, they approved all of them. Um, the animal and garden uh, amendment they did change from what the Planning Commission recommended um, they made a change to the sections regarding gardens and um, they they removed the um, standard that stated 20% um, of the front yard could be covered in a garden and 80% of the side and rear yard and then the requirement that um, gardens be set back three feet from the property line so it states that gardens are permitted, <laughs> which is, is good because there was really nowhere in the municipal code that expressly stated that you could have a garden on a residential property, specifically in the R1 and the R2 district. Um, otherwise, they didn't make any changes to um, any of the other, oh, the parking, um, Oh, there was, there was in the C1 parking chapter, there are changes, they, there was three or four, sorry, I'm trying to do this off the top of my head, four items in order to request that you had to provide in order to request that um, parking reduction in the C1 district. The first one required that you had to provide a parking study um, they changed that to um, the parking study being optional. Um, but then left all the other three items. It was a study uh, giving information regarding the use of the property, um, the surrounding, what's, what's already provided on the property as far as parking and um, I think what, what surrounding, what's available surrounding and such. Um, so those were the changes for, for those um, items. Also the, the, the chicken and, <laughs> there was a lot of discussion on chickens. Um, they are putting off making that, that ordinance change effective until February. Um, they have asked that the police department provide them with more information regarding um, enforce or animal control um, and them uh, being able to catch chickens at large mm -hmm. and um, where they can, if the um, shelter that they use can accommodate for any chickens they catch. Um, and then I just wanted to give you an update on, and we are moving forward with a process of rewriting um, the zoning ordinance and subdivision regulations. Um, we put out a request for proposal for consulting firms to work with staff to rewrite those regulations. Um, we received eight responses um, with those and we are right now reviewing those responses and um, will interview a few of the candidates and we would anticipate bringing that back to the council February 2nd um, to move forward with the consultant for that rewrite. We would anticipate probably about 18 months plus or minus um, to bring that through the process and of course, the Planning Commission will be involved with that. Um, the RFP included information about a um, 
a committee to work on that with staff, similar to what you saw with um, the comprehensive plan. So we will we will keep you up to date on uh, what's going on with that, but you'll definitely be be involved with that process. Great, thanks for the updates. I don't have anything um, else this evening. I would um, entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I second. The motion to adjourn made by Limer with a second by Barber. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Meetings adjourned. Thank you all. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice evening. Good holiday.